listening to the Prevailing Word Podcast. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get right into today's message from the Word of God. Please open up your Bibles to the book of Luke, the 10th chapter. Luke, the 10th chapter. And beginning at verse 13. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethesda. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And for you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, "The Lord, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, but uh, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I want to talk about the book of life, but before we do, we will pray. Father, we thank you that your word tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. We thank you, Lord, that the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature that is hidden from your sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. Father, I thank you that your word gives light, it gives understanding to the simple, and that the entrance of your word gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. We thank you, Lord, that every word of God is pure, and you are a shield to those who put their trust in you. And Father, I thank you that you desire truth in the inner part, and in the hidden parts you will make us to know wisdom. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of life. Um, a, a lot has, has, has been shared about uh, the book of life in the scriptures. Uh, and uh, just want to share these, these thoughts uh, with you. As you can see here in the book of Luke chapter uh, 10, uh, Jesus commissioned 70 disciples along with his 12. So there were 12 disciples and then there were 70. I, firm, I firmly believe that Matthias, who happened to replace Judas of Iscariot because he committed suicide, was a part of that 70. I could be wrong, but we'll see later on. But nonetheless, Jesus selected 70 disciples to expand his ministry. If you were to go, uh, just as a side issue, back up to verse 1, which is where I should have started, we will see the commissioning of the 70. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the way. And so this is the commissioning of the 70, and then he gave further instructions. And so I just wanted to point that out to you. When he got to 
of uh, when, we, when we get down to verse 17, I should say, the 70 return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are sub subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And of course, this is the book of Revelation chapter 12. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents, serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. In other words, don't rejoice in the fact that demons are subject to my name. Don't rejoice in this. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And so the 70 were, were perhaps a little perplexed, maybe, maybe not. But the Lord gave them a word that is of importance, not, not only to them, but also to us today. Do not rejoice in the fact that demons are subject to his name. Rejoice in the fact that your names are written in heaven. And, and that's, that's paramount because after we leave this life or the Lord's coming, whichever comes first, we want to make sure that our name is written in heaven. Because it does us no good to come to church, sit in church, be in church, be a part of, of, of what's happening in church, and our name is not there in heaven. Does us no good. In other words, we simply wasted our time. And so we have to make every effort to make sure that we're doing the things that the Lord commanded us to do as far as being born again, that our names are written in heaven. And, and watch over that carefully. Uh, the most important thing is not what you, what, what you will have your family members write about you in your obituary. It, it doesn't matter to you. You're gone. But if you're gone and your name is not in the book of life, it's, it was all for nothing. And, and so that's why, you know, we shared about last week, uh, depart from, from iniquity, depart from, from sin. It, and, and, and we're going to see the reason why, because Jesus, uh, uh, when, he, when we get over into Revelation chapter 3, in fact, turn there, Revelation chapter 3, we will see that there was a dead church. In Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to begin at verse 1, we're going to see a dead church. Now, now watch how, how this story unfolds. Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And just in case you want to know what are the seven spirits of God, all you have to do is go into the book of Isaiah chapter 11, which we'll not get to today. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1, you will see the seven spirits of God defined. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but are dead. In other words, the reputation was clear. You guys all are alive. But you see, you can, you can say that you're alive, but from the perspective of the head of the church, he says that you're dead. Now there's only one reason why a person can be in church and be dead. We'll get to that in a moment. But notice in verse two, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Even though they're dead, there are things that remain. But notice what Jesus said, that are ready to die. In other words, you're about to lose what those, those things that remain. You're about to lose those things. And so we have to be very careful that when we say that we're alive and then we're dead, we got problems. We got issues. We can all say that, yeah, we're alive. We're alive. But Jesus said you're dead. And so we have to make sure that we are exactly what Jesus said we are. We are alive. 
Now, the only way that you're going to know that you are alive is that you have to find out why am I dead? Because you want to know why Jesus said, but you are dead. So he says here, for I have not found your works perfect before God. What, what works what, were perfect? You, you, you haven't found our works perfect before God? Well, you got to look at the church of Philadelphia and the church of Smyrna. There were no issues with the, with the church in Philadelphia and no issues with the church with Smyrna. They, in fact, they were being persecuted for standing for Christ the way that they're supposed to. So those two churches were alive. They were alive simply because they were doing exactly what the Lord commanded them to do. Verse 3, remember therefore how you have received and heard. Because, you know, when churches start out, some churches, they do start out on the, on the right foot. They start out correctly. But all of a sudden, over time, things begin to change. They begin to add doctrine, take away doctrine, just like the culture of today. The culture of today doesn't want anything to do with the Jesus that is initially preached. They want to be able to, uh, to have allowances or overlooking things. But the gospel remains the same. Remember therefore how you have received and heard. In other words, go back to how you started. He said, hold fast and repent. Now repent doesn't mean to feel sorry only. Doesn't mean that you're just sorrowful about what took place. But it means to turn. Hold fast. What? What are we to hold fast? Notice what he says. What we've received and what we heard. What we've received and what we heard. Hold fast to that and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Now, we always associate this as the coming of the Lord. And in, in this sense, it is just about Jesus entering a church and nobody knows. You see, the Lord can come into this place at any time and have a seat. And he's sitting and he's watching. He could be watching our hearts, whether we are true worshipers or not. Whether we're holding fast to the truth of God's word or not. Because we can pretend. But in the eyesight of God, there is no creature that is hidden from his sight. And so, well, pretending does us no good. He says, hold fast and repent, therefore. And says, therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. Even in Sardis, this dead church, a place that has no life. Even a few individuals whose names have not defiled their garments. So how do we defile a garment? Sin. Sin. Sin is what defiles the garments. And that's why they're a dead church. You, ha uh, you have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So how do we get our garments white? By the blood. How do we get clean? By the blood and the word. So if we have anything that's filthy in our lives, anything that is dirt, dirty in our lives, the prayer to pray is not, Lord, please take these things out of me. No. The prayer to pray is, Lord, forgive me and cleanse me of sin. Cleanse me and, 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 and wash me, make me clean, make me white as snow so that I can be worthy to wear this garment of white. Now watch in verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name 
from the book of life. What is that telling us? That, that is telling us that our names can be blotted out. Uh, there's a saying about once saved, always saved. And it doesn't work that way. Because how can you claim to be in Christ and live in sin? It doesn't work. And so if this church was living in sin, at least the majority of the believers, because there are a few names in Sardis that have not defiled their garments, their names will be blotted out of the book of life if they don't get it corrected. Meaning that you're no longer going to heaven. But look at what Jesus continue to, continues to say. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So go to the book of Romans chapter 6 because we need to see uh, what it is that we need not to be dead about. We, it, it said they defiled the garments, which we know that sin defiles the garments. Romans chapter 6 beginning at verse 1. Sh what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? How can we live any longer in the sin that we had, were dead to? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So that's how you clean up your garments. But see, notice the contrast here between being dead to God and alive to sin. We're supposed to be alive to God and dead indeed to sin. Going down a little further, verse 7 says, For if he who has died has been freed from sin, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. Once for all, rather. But the life that he gives, he, li he lives. For, but the life that he lives, rather, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The, the church of Sardis was the opposite. They were dead to God and alive to sin, and they had their garments defiled. And so the Lord told them, remember in verse 3, in, in Revelation 3, remember therefore how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you like a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come. You have a few names written in Sardis, verse 4, who has not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Go, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Lord will not blot out our names if we are doing what we're supposed to do hold fast what we've received and heard hold fast what we've received and heard and stay consistent stay consistent for the rest of our lives 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 look at verse uh, 9 verse 9 and so Paul 
He shows us this in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So when Jesus said, I will not blot out his name from the book of life, it's because you're unrighteous. But if you're righteous, your name will remain in the book of life. So if your name is blotted out of the book of life, then that means that you're unrighteous and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice what Jesus continued to say in the book of Revelation chapter 3. He said, he that overcomes. Well, what are we to overcome? Let's see what, what the unrighteous are doing in comparison. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators. Overcome fornication. Nor idolaters. Overcome idolatry. Now we don't know the list of sins that the church in Sardis uh, may have participated in but nonetheless we know that they have defiled their garments and sin defiled, defiles the garments so we ought to overcome the sins so here's the list at least a short list nor adulterers nor homosexuals now the word homosexuals is is defined as effeminate or soft or catamites in other words men having sex with boys nor sodomites. Now this is homosexuality. Men having sex with men and women having sex with women. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards. Oh, what's wrong with drinking? Well, if you become a drunkard, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Nor revilers. You know what a reviler is? One that stirs up trouble. Do nothing but abuse people. And so, don't be a reviler, um, nor extortioners. Extortioners will not inherit the kingdom of God. What are they doing? They are robbers or individuals that use cunning ways to take things from people or by force, if you will. That if you don't give me what I ask for, I am going to beat you and abuse you. Extortioners will not inherit the kingdom of God. And, and so we know what defiles the garment. But I want to get to something that's very interesting that is, uh, is of grave importance about the book of life, which I'll get to at, at the end. But there was something in the book of Exodus that is very interesting. Go to Exodus, the 32nd chapter. Exodus chapter 32. Because this is the first instance that we will hear about God's book. It is a single book. It is one book. It is not a, comp a compilation of books. It is one book. In Exodus chapter 32, look at uh, starting in We'll, 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 we'll start at, we want to read the whole thing because, not, not all of it, but most of it so that we can get a good backdrop. So, um, we'll start in uh, verse 11. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, He brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or Jacob, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And all, that's, and all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, where the two tablets of testimony were, were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides. Now watch this. At, you know, when, remember you, we all saw the Ten Commandments? And we all saw the hand of God write the Ten Commandments. And we saw that it was written on one side each. 
Well, that's outside of what we see in scripture. Now watch this, because I was corrected about this just yesterday. Watch, watch how it says. The tablets were written on both sides. So here we got this picture that it was on, that it was just two tablets, but it was written on one side. So when we read both tablets, we're like saying uh, uh, one tablet here, one tablet here. But you see, the Bible says, thank God for the Bible. The Bible says the tablets were written on both sides. Instead of two, exactly. On the one side and on the other, they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the noise of the shout of victory, nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. So it was as soon as he came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. When he took, now the Ten Commandments show Moses casting the, the two tablets at the calf. So once again, we see scripture say that he threw the tablets at the foot of the mountain. So now, a few weeks ago, you begin to see what I said, that here they are, they got out of Egypt, and next thing you know, they're worshiping a calf on the mountain, and at the top of the mountain is God. They're doing it in his face. So Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands, and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Not at the calf, but at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which, he, which they had made, burned it in the fire, and grounded it to powder, and he scattered it on the water, and made the children of Israel drink it. I mean, they're going to be dead anyway. <laughs> and you'll see why. Verse 21, And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? So Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. Wait a minute. God's wrath was hot. Moses' wrath was hot. He had every right. So Aaron was trying to make an excuse. Preacher, why are you getting mad about sin all the time? Preacher, why are you talking about sin all the time? Because it's the one thing that you will be judged for and I'm trying to help you out so that way you won't sin against God and your name not be blotted out of the book of life. I'm just trying to do you a favor. Uh, for they said to me, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. You see, the idea of making a calf didn't come from the people themselves. It also was in the heart of Aaron. Because on the Mount of Horeb would be the place where Aaron would die. He would be stripped of his high priestly clothes and he would die there simply for this sin. Make us gods that shall go before us as, as for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. We don't know what happened. So since he ain't around, since he's nowhere to be found, Let's just go ahead and build a God. Well, wait a minute. You know he went up to the mountain, right? All you got to do is look up and see where God is. And that's where Moses would be. 
And I said to, to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire. And this calf came out. Oh, so you just threw the stuff in the fire, and then by itself it came out. It doesn't work that way. Because when you're melting something down, evidently you have a device where you can take what's melted down and spill it into a mold. Or if you're not going to spill it into a mold, at least you can just spill it out and then while it is still able to be molded into something, you could take a hammer and mold it into something. Like a blacksmith. If you ever watch blacksmith, they always pour something, then they pour it out, they pour it into a mold, then they take the mold out and they start hammering it. Like with uh, knives and swords and things of that nature. But out came this calf, miraculously. No, nah, it didn't happen that way. Now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them, to, the, to their shame among their enemies. In other words, they were loose in their living. They weren't restrained. They weren't disciplined. They were loose in their living. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side, and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp. And let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day. For every man has opposed his son and his brother. In other words, they judged them for the sin of idolatry. Now this is the 32nd chapter of the book of Exodus. If you go back into the book of Exodus chapter 20, you will see the Ten Commandments. The first two of which says, That you shall have no other gods before me. That you shall not make any graven images of the, of the, of the animals, fish, birds, whatever. You just don't make a graven image. And then you get to chapter 32 and you see that they violated the two first commandments of God. Right out of the box. Verse 30. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, now watch this, this is, get, this is getting good. But if not, I will, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. Now look, they sinned. It's on them. I want to keep my name in the book. But Moses' intercession was so heartfelt that he appeased the heart of God and didn't do that. He pleased God so much that, that, that Moses was willing to even die for his people to atone for the sin. Blot me out of the book. But look at what God says. Watch this. Now therefore go, lead the people to the place which, of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel, meaning Jesus, shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sin.
But look back at verse 33. I skipped that. Verse 33. Go back there. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. You see what happens when we sin? The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel 33, The soul that sins, it shall die. And so, it is because of sin. Remember what it says in the book of Rome, uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. You see, when the child of God is serious with God about turning from sin, your name is in the book of life. And placing faith on Christ alone. Because the combination of that two is necessary. Because you can't get in on your own righteousness. You need the righteousness of Christ to get in. And so that's why we admonish people. Yes, turn from sin, but that's not enough. You now need to place faith on Christ alone for salvation. Because you can't be righteous on your own. But sin is the reason why people's names are blotted out of the book. Now verse 35 says, So the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. Go to Psalm 69. Psalm 69. Some interesting things about the, the book of life. It is not only called uh, the book of life or the book that is, that which you have written. It is also known as the book of living or the book of the living. Look at verse uh, 20, 28. Psalm 69 verse 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. You see the book of living is the book of the righteous which is the book of life. That's very important for us to know. Go to Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah the 4th chapter. And look at verse 3. Isaiah 4 and verse 3. And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem. Same book of life. Same book of life. So now, go to the book of Daniel, chapter 12. Daniel, the 12th chapter, and verse 1. Daniel, the 12th chapter, and verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble. And this is speaking of the final week of Daniel's prophecy, which you read numerous times in uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Same book that was referred to by Moses that we initially seen in the book of Exodus chapter 32. And many of those who sleep in the dust, shall, dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And this is the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust that Jesus mentions in John chapter 5. So now we know that there is a book that is written and it is the book of the righteous. Go now into the New Testament, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And this is very interesting. When we read this in Paul's letter to the Philippians, the fourth chapter, and beginning at verse 3. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So here we see that we read from Luke chapter uh, 10 that, that your names are written in heaven. Luke 10, 10 and verse 19. That's the first uh, instance in the New Testament that we know that a person's name that is righteous in Christ is in heaven. And then we see here Paul alluding to this same book that Jesus referred to that Moses preached of, that Isaiah prophesied of, and the writer of the book of Psalm, Psalm 69 spoke of. And the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Is your name in the book of life? 
Good question. If you're in Christ, you have no problem. If you repented of sin and placed faith on Christ alone, you have no problem. Your name is written there in the book of life. Thing is, you have to keep your name there. Because Christ alluded and spoke clearly in Revelation 33 that your name can be blotted out. And the reason why the name, your name can be blotted out is because your garment is filthy. So if your garment is filthy, there's a good chance that your name is blotted out. Go to Hebrews 12. Unless you repent, of course. Unless you repent. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. To God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So there is a registry in heaven. This registry is what we read as far as the book of life that Paul alluded to in the book of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, which we read in the book of of uh, Psalm, 20, uh, Psalm 69, which we also read in the book of Isaiah chapter 4, which we see in the book of Exodus chapter 32. Same book. This is some good stuff. Go to Revelation 13 now. Revelation 13. Here in Revelation 13, we're going to see individuals who have taken the mark in which their names will not be found in the book of life. Uh, Revelation 13, look at verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I started the wrong verse. Go to verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 6. Revelation 13, verse 6. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And this is the Jews in Jerusalem. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So there are individuals who will take this mark, will worship this image, will worship the beast, and their, and their names are not written in heaven. Their names are not written in the book of life. Go to the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. Revelation 14 and verse 9, starting there. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of, the, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they, shall, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Their names are not written in the book of life. They're done. It's, it's over for them. There is no way possible for them to ever be saved. And that's why it's very important that if your name is there in the book of life, that we ought to keep our name there. And it's going to be a great struggle. We'll show that struggle, hopefully, if I remember, uh, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 7. We're going, we're going to see that, that struggle as to why. So now, go into um, Revelation 20. Revelation 20. And in Revelation 20, verse 11, 
we will see I can never get my finger to do what I wanted to do oh, I do it that way verse 11 says then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven had heaven fled away now remember what Jesus said in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 24 where he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Here is the passing away of the heaven and the earth. Why? They fled before him. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book, singularly, another book was opened. Same book that Moses was talking about in Exodus 32. Same book that we read about in Psalm 69. Same book that we saw in the book of Isaiah chapter 4. Same book that Jesus spoke of in Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. Same book that Paul spoke of in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. The books were open, but watch this. And, and books were open and another book, singular, was open, which is the book of life and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books because see in the book of life it's not a book of your works it is a registry as it says in the book of, of uh, Hebrews chapter 12 of individual names now what are you going to do when somebody has a name like yours, now I'm banking on the fact that my name is only that my name is the only, but I found out on YouTube that I that there's there's an other people named Fred Rochester, but they don't have the same middle name as I do. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, if that were to happen, we gotta recognize that each one of our retinas is different, our DNA is different, no one person fingerprints is the same. Out of billions and billions and billions of people, I am an individual. So in the book of life, which is the registry in heaven, is my name. Now, some will say, well, you shouldn't be too giddy about that. How do you know that your name is in there? Well, look at what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. He said, whose names are written in the book of life. And then look at what Jesus said in the book of Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. But rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now is Jesus lying? Evidently. If he lied, then he can't be trusted. And lying is a sin. So if he lied, he's going to hell. And we all know that that ain't happening. So you can rest assured that because you have repented of sin and placed faith on Christ alone that your name is in heaven. Your name is written in heaven. Your name is written in the registry. Your name is in the book of life. Just don't do anything to have it blotted out. What, what is that anything? It's a sin. Now remember what Israel did? They made a calf in front of God's face. And Moses said, if you're not going to forgive, blot me out of the book. And, he, and the Lord answered in response and says, those that sinned against me, I will blot out. So not only are those individuals that are 20, uh, 40 years old and, and under, because remember the children of Israel for 40 years wandered in the wilderness, not only did they not get into the promised land, but those individuals that sinned against God as far as the calf is concerned, their names are blotted out. Now remember what we saw in the book of Exodus? That, the Lord, that Moses told the Levites to get your sword and to kill your brother, kill everybody. He was atoning because those men, those men weren't sorry for their sin. They weren't repentant of their sin. And they, and they, they lost their lives. The, their names, 3,000 of them so far, their names are not in the book of life and they are in hell right now. Sin is the reason why a person's name will be blotted out of the book of life. So we got to do everything in our power to stay in Christ 
to stay out of sin and not to sin against God otherwise our name will be blotted out of the book of life now go back to Revelation 17 I want if you're there if you're there already I'm sorry if you're there already no you're in you're in Revelation 20 um, um, let, let me finish Revelation uh, Revelation 20 let me let me finish with 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 that first and 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 then then we'll go back to Revelation 17 look at verse 14 in Revelation 20 then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire so all those people starting with with possibly Cain I don't know if he repented but we'll see later on all the way up until the present time before the great white throne judgment including all those people that died in Noah's flood that died Sodom and Gomorrah that died worshiping a calf all those people will be before the great white throne judgment and because they were blotted out of the book their name is not in the book of life and guess what now they're cast into the lake of fire forever. There's no escaping of this. There's no way possible that they can escape this. Now, go back to Revelation 17 and verse 8, which is what I skipped. I, sh I shouldn't have skipped uh, verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and, it, and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition, meaning the lake of fire, and those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. You mean to tell me that God already know from the foundation of the world whose names are not written in the book of life? Well, he is God. Some will say, that's not fair. Well, wait a minute. You got a problem there. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. He doesn't sin. He's a just and faithful God. If you do righteousness, and you do what's right, and you repent and you place faith on Christ alone, you don't have a problem. So I don't see why we as believers should be arguing about the fact that it's unfair. Well, wait a minute. You got a problem. He is God. The, the argument is further revealed that who are we to instruct God? So we're going to teach God what, what's fair. No, it doesn't work that way. He's God. He's just. He's righteous. And he's fair. So let's not get into that argument like the world, well, I just don't think that that's right. Well, wait a minute, he's God. Now remember we remember with Job, in Job chapter 40, God appears in a whirlwind before Job. And he says, Job, you're going to answer me, man up. And so the Lord talked about Leviathan. He also talked about a fiery, a, a fire-breathing dragon, and how these big beasts roam the earth, and that everybody is scared of these beasts. <laughs> the mastodons, all of the dinosaurs, God created them, and nobody has a problem being afraid of them, but God says, "I'm greater than them." I created them. You're more afraid of them than me? I made them. So where's my respect? And that's the issue. Man thinks that he can negotiate with God. And then God shows up and shows that he's God. And the problem will go away quickly. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. That's why it's called the apocalypse or the revelation of Jesus Christ because Jesus said that you're going to see the Son of Man coming with great power and glory 
He's going to show the world how powerful God is. And so he can blot out everybody's name in the book if you're not, if your garments are defiled. So here's what we must do to keep our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Here's what we must do. Look at verse 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth, do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Here's another thing that we must do to make sure that we keep our names written in the book of life. Go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew the 7th chapter. Look at verse 13, which is what we, where we talked about on numerous occasions. To keep our names written in the book of life, this must be a part of our lives every single day. is entered by the narrow gate it begins by saying let me uh, use another uh, device here enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it so the ones that are on the road to destruction their names are not in the book of life at least for some of them not yet unless they repent unless they repent and place faith on Christ alone. As of this moment, while they are alive on the earth, they're on the broad is the way that leads to destruction. They're going through the wide gate. Verse 14 says, but because, the, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the, is the way and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Few! I mean, this is, we're in the struggle of our lives, some of us. We're struggling like, with, like the rich young ruler when, when he told Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, why do you, and Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none that is good but one that is God. Keep the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And then the rich young ruler said, all these things I've kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? And Jesus says, sell all you have, give alms to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. You see, it's always that one little thing that holds us back. To keep our names in the book of life, we even got to give up that one little thing that prevents us from having eternal life. Give it up so that we can keep our name in the book of life and we can rejoice together in heaven with the Lord. You've been listening to the Prevailing Word Podcast. We're on Apple Podcast, Amazon Podcast, Spotify, and Spreaker. The Minister's Crucible and Prevailing Word Live is on YouTube. There's exclusive content for ministers of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ found at theministerscrucible.com. Follow Prevailing Word Ministries Incorporated and The Minister's Crucible on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening.